morning, everybody. Uh, thanks very much for those coming along this morning. Um, welcome to this, the Digital Environment Programme's seventh uh, webinar series, on, and this one's on AI for the environment. I'm Matt Fry from UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology, hosting this, um, which is the fourth webinar in this, in this series on, on AI environmental science, supported by NERC and the Constructing a Digital Environment Programme. Um, so this is a program aiming to develop the digitally enabled environment, benefiting researchers, policymakers, businesses, communities and individuals alike. The, um, the program is running for a number of years with the aim of envisaging and developing approaches to creating the future digital environment, exploiting advances in technology, increasingly diverse data sets to improve our understanding and management of the environment. And it's done this through funding a number of projects and a range of other activities, um, and also through building the community in the area of digital environment. Um, running events um, and a successful conference last year, um, at which point I should remind people that there's a, another co conference coming up this year than, from the Digital Environment Programme, the NERC Digital Gathering 2023. It's open for registrations and submission of abstract. The details should be in a link in the chat soon. Um, it's going to take place the 10th to the 11th of July at the British Antarctic Survey offices in Cambridge, and it's free to attend, so book your place now. So this, as I said, this is the seventh series of webinars in the in the, the this um, series from the Digital Environment Programme. In this in this series, we're con considering the role and the opportunity, as well as some of the pitfalls in the use of AI in environmental science. Um, and the format of webinars um, is to kind of invite a presentation from leading experts in this field across different kind of science domains and different using different methods, followed by a chance for um, Q and A. Um, and could I invite you to um, look at the links in the chat, um, follow the Digital Environment Twitter feed, and also subscribe to the YouTube channel if you haven't done so yet. So there's all the talks are on there. It's a fantastic range of really interesting talks, um, well worth looking into. So this, yeah, this series, as I said, focuses on the development, use and application of artificial intelligence techniques in environmental science. AI tools are enabling new analytical value to be delivered from existing sources of data, as well as providing powerful tools for generating new data. And um, this webinar series is going to cover activities across this area. So I'm very excited today to say that uh, today's presentation is a seminar from Tom August, of, also of the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology, always gives uh, really uh, interesting talks. And he's going to be talking about AI for on the ground biodiversity monitoring. So Tom's a computational ecologist at the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology. His research focuses on the use of technology to better, better our understanding of biodiversity, both through innovative data collection methods and also engaging communications. Um, he comes from a background in field and applied ecology and now focusing on applying AI methods to improve the quality and quantity of data that we collect about biodiversity, from remote monitoring stations and mobile applications um, through to natural language processing and virtual reality. Tom's shown that these novel methods can be used to improve our biodiversity research. And in this webinar, Tom's going to um, discuss recent advantage in technologies um, and AI for monitoring biodiversity, including computer vision, AI tools for processing audio. So good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm going to be talking about AI for on the ground biodiversity monitoring. And I put on the ground there in quotes because I'm not going to be talking about anything satellite based or drone based. I'm talking about monitoring you know, with, with feet on the ground. And then when I talk about biodiversity monitoring, I'm really talking about species level observations so what species has been observed <coughs> where has it been observed and when has it have been observed and i'm going to present a number of different case studies uh, around this topic and so also want to say up front that this involves collaboration with many others um so a lot of things i'll be talking about are developed by other people uh, either at uk ukch or at our collaborators okay so I feel it wouldn't be a, an AI presentation without some sort of generative art. So I will get that out of the way on, on the first slide. This is Mid Journey's uh, interpretation of an android undertaking a uh, but butterfly transect. A butterfly transect is very, very classic, well-established way of monitoring butterflies. And here you see an android walking through a lovely meadow surrounded by an improbably large number of, of butterflies. Um, but I think this image captures two of the key elements of biodiversity monitoring, which is the observation process and the identification process. So the observation here being the, the visual acquisition of information uh, and then identification, then the reasoning of that image into um, a species identity. 
but that could also be you know, acoustic uh, listening and then identification that way. Um, so observe and identify it sounds kind of a bit like um, serve and protect like the LAPDs. <laughs> you know, it's the, the androids of the future, their, their mantra. Um, so I'm going to delve into this uh, concept of observing identification using AI uh, through uh, three different case studies. So the first is about AI driven biodiversity monitoring. So can we build systems which do both these things and are driven by AI, both observe and identify? So kind of with minimal uh, human involvement. The second is, um, can we improve that identification step by developing AI that are human inspired in their model design? So they take elements of, of what humans do when they uh, identify a species. And we, we code that into the models to see if it improves their ability. And then lastly, um, I want to talk about AI system monitoring. So this is where not we're not trying to replace the humans in the process, but how do we, so we're not trying to put this Android in the butterfly menu, uh, in butterfly uh, meadow, but how do we um, align, how do we, how do we supply AI tools which will assist a human who is undertaking these sorts of um, assessments? I am a data set. Maybe I am more than a data set. I am a data set dreaming. So to give a bit more color to the presentation, I'm going to drop in some random bits of poetry. Um, I've been lucky enough to be involved in a, a collaboration with Thomas Sharp as a, as a part of the CDE funded um, Decide project in this work called uh, The Datasets Dream. So a few of these will pop up as we go through and we'll use them as kind of starting points to, to um, tackle some of the um, some of the AI topics. Uh, we will be running as a part of the um, digital gathering um, that, uh, that Matt mentioned, we will be running a short workshop on uh, artist scientist collaboration. So if you want to hear more about Datasets Dream and uh, our experiences, then uh, you can catch up, catch up there. So um, biodiversity monitoring has been going on for hundreds of years. And um, a lot of what we do at CEH around biodiversity monitoring is uh, citizen science or community led monitoring. So this is uh, volunteers, members of the public going out and recording the nature that they see. So kind of natural history. <laughs> um, so through these hundreds of years uh, uh, of natural history in the UK, we have large amounts of data. Um, I mean, the large volume starts sort of after the sort of 1970s, we start to get sort of fairly decent amounts of data from which we can then uh, extrapolate trends in biodiversity over time. And these data collected by members of the public across a real wide range of taxa um, really underpin a lot of the reporting that we do in the UK on our biodiversity. And actually also globally, um, they underpin a lot of the kind of global statistics on trends in biodiversity. Across the UK landmass, humans observe butterflies and moths. They log their observations. Their data comprises location, date, and species name. These are the fundamentals of reality, space-time, and imagination. Location and date, coordinates of space-time, species name, a fictive layer, created by minds. So in the, the poem of Dacia's dream, it's, it's uh, uh, a poem which is supposedly the dream of a data set. So a data set uh, which contains butterfly and moth observations has become conscious and it's having its first dream. And here, they, you know, it, it talk, it's talking about uh, natural historians going out and logging their observations. That's what I'm going to talk, talk more about. I do quite like this two sentence or three sentence refrain at the end here, where it, it, it's kind of tearing apart the, the biological record is uh, you know, species, location and time. And location and time being fundamental physical properties but the species name being something that's created by humans and that's not something i'd really thought about but we do have a lot of problems with species names different people giving these different species names or selling them in different ways um so it kind of adds adds a nice kind of insight into why that's particularly problematic as it's something that is human generated i've got a cough i'm going to try and mute myself when i cough just not to blow your ears out um this is data coming in to iRecord. iRecord is one of the citizen science platforms that uh, we look after at UKCEH. And you can see here a very large number of observations, over a million records. This is a few years old now, so we get even more records than this now. 
spatial coverage, you can see it's pretty good spatial coverage across the United Kingdom. Um, there are spatial biases. So, you know, places where that are sparsely populated tend to get fewer records. Um, and you also see a bias in the taxonomic coverage. So this blue line that goes up very strongly here are the invertebrates. So that's the, the principal groups that we focus on are the invertebrates. Um, I mean, mainly because the so things like mammals, um, the birds, they're quite well studied by or supported by other, other charities, other NGOs. Um, and these, these uh, sort of spatial biases are something we think a lot about. There's also temporal biases, which we think a lot about um, as well when we come to analyze these data. So I want to move on to this first case study where we think about, uh, we've, we've done this biological recording in the past that's, that's principally led by volunteers. How can we use AI to move to a system which could be entirely independent of, of human intervention? Um, so the case study here is around moths, and this is the classic pose of a mother. Um, so this is a, a, a moth wall set up. So hopefully you can see my cursor. This light at the top is a UV light. It's very bright, uh, and moths are particularly attracted to UV. It's hung on a wall. Uh, so when moths come to the UV light, they'll then land on the wall. And then Chris, our mother here, has got a, a torch spotlight, which is illuminating the moth, um, giving nice illumination so that he can collect a photograph on his phone, which he's then submitting to iNaturalist. So the key features here of a, a moth a moth wall is the UV light, the wall, a spotlight, and a camera. If we convert that into a system, you end up with something like this. So this was designed, designed by Aarhus University uh, and published in 2021. And what you can see here is a UV light that sits on top of a small wall. And then in front of it is a camera in a box and a ring light around the camera illuminating it. So you've got all the same four components that you have here with Chris doing his mothing, except now it's in a box and it can sit out on its own. So we first used these um, uh, bought from the, from the Denmark team back in 20. 21, and uh, we used it to <coughs> monitor land for network rails. Network rail were doing a pilot into monitoring biodiversity on their line side, and they didn't want to send any people out onto the line side for, for safety reasons. So they're interested in what technology they could use for monitoring their biodiversity. We actually used uh, a whole range of different technologies, but this one uh, showed particular promise. It did attract uh, quite a lot of moths to it. The images were pretty good, um, and moths are quite distinctive in, in how they look. So. Uh, it seemed like it would lend itself fairly well to uh, computer vision. So working in partnership with that, that team from Denmark, we kind of developed at CEH a second iteration. So we have a, a workshop uh, here at CEH and a group of engineers um, who kind of took in that, that first model and kind of redesigned it. So um, there's some small tweaks. So it's using a, a slightly different, more robust uh, light here. Um, the, the camera housing is uh, waterproof. It's actually been run under half a meter of water and it still works since we put in a 60 degree oven for a day and it, and it all still worked. So that's quite different to how an ecologist would do it. We'd have a lot of gaffer tape and old ice cream tubs involved. So it's a you know, proper, proper bit of hardware um, and it's yeah robust and, and scalable. So we can, you know, we're, we're looking now to see if we can outsource production uh, given demand around it. This is the, the front of that, the camera bit. So this is looking uh, to the right is looking at that that board. So you see the camera in the middle and these these lights around the outside which are illuminating that board, getting good pictures of the moths. You'll also see we don't we don't just get moths. We do get other animals too, um, which are attracted to lights at, at night. Um, but at the moment we're, we're focusing on the moths. At some point we need to come back and uh, look at those other insects as well. If you open up the the box, this is what it looks like. Um, the key components are this uh, this Raspberry Pi uh, kind of top center. Uh, and below that, the SSD, which is storing the images. So the Raspberry Pi is controlling the camera. The camera can take a picture when it detects motion or on an interval, whichever you prefer. Um, the images are all stored locally on that hard drive. Uh, and then the whole system is turned on and off using this timer really relay at the bottom. And, and the rest of the things just kind of make that, make that work. Uh, we have a project just started, which is looking at moving to edge processing. So we'll get the AI 
model onto the, the Raspberry Pi and processing the images in, in real time. That would allow us to send back little text packets daily of the results from, from a camera trap. Because these systems are designed to work uh, autonomously and remotely. Um, so they could be deployed you know, for months at a time without people needing to go and, and, and intervene. So they run off solar and, and battery. Um, so as long as you've got you know, good sun, these things can run for a long, a long period of time. This SSD, um, you, can, you can change that so sensitivity to motion or the interval, obviously change how much data you collect, but these SSDs can last many months. <clears throat> so here's a, a video of it running in, in action out in, uh, in Panama. And you can see the, the moths flying around. They're attracted in by that UV light that acts kind of like a lighthouse, kind of really brings things in from, from a distance. And then when they get close, they see that illuminated whiteboard and they land on that. You also see quite a lot um, of moths there in motion in front of the camera. So out in Panama, uh, we had it set to, to take a picture whenever it detected motion. You end up with a video of the entire night. So it's probably not the wisest way to collect images in a very biodiverse region. Um, but if you're somewhere where there's, you know, if you're in sort of the, the Arctic tundra where there's very little activity, that might be quite a sensible thing to do. So in the tropics, it might be more sensible to use a kind of interval uh, approach. I dream another figment, an image migrating and multiplying through the internet. It is of a boy releasing a butterfly and asking, is this a pigeon? Narrator, it is not a pigeon, it is a butterfly. The boy is an android lacking a sufficiently structured database. So I love this last line, the boy is an android lacking a sufficiently structured database. If anyone who's, who's sort of developed AI tools for classification, this is often the main problem is getting that sufficiently structured database of images that are labeled that you can use to train your AI. And so here, you know, the, the boy, the android doesn't have enough data to differentiate a pigeon from a butterfly. And that's obviously, this is the next step with our MOS system. So we collected our images from the system and we now need to develop an AI tool to classify them. This, this section of the poem is actually inspired by this meme, which some people might have seen, uh, comes from a, uh, a comic book, I think. So here's the AI workflow for this MOS trap. Um, so starting top left, we have an image that we collect from the trap of, of moths on the board. Uh, the first step is actually we do kind of three models in, in series. The first step is to detect, to localize the moths within the image, and kind of cut, cut them out, cookie cut them out. They then go to a classifier, which tries to differentiate moths from non-moths. Okay, so that works. Uh, this first step, localization, works very well. And this step, the binary classifier, works very well as well. Um, we then take the moths, uh, we leave the non-moths, we take the moths and those moths go into a classifier which then tries to assign that moth to a species. That's where we end up here top right. The species classifier is built using a different workflow. So it's not trained using images from our traps. It's trained using images from GBIF. So GBIF is a large uh, global infrastructure that stores biological records data. Um, so a lot of photographs coming in from Citizens Iron apps that look like this. So they don't really look like our images, which are on a white background. They look a little bit different, of, often you know, close up high quality cameras on with the species or vegetation. Um, and we train uh, our classifier uh, on that. So this, this uh, species level classifier is performing around 80% when challenged on GBIF data, held out GBIF data. Uh, we know it's not performing so well uh, on our trap images, as you would expect, because that, that transfer of one model from one uh, kind of uh, environment of images to another, you always see a reduction in performance. But we expect that as we start to provide labeled data from the machines, that should that just step back up and should maybe even improve beyond those sorts of uh, performance that we're seeing. It's also worth saying that that performance is very varied across species. Some species of moth are you know, very uh, distinctive uh, and so it can be very confident. Uh, there's a quite a long tail of moths where we have few images uh, and the species are quite hard to tell apart. <clears throat> and those, the model performs uh, more poorly. Now, also worth saying that this, this work is being done by our partners in Mila and uh, Montreal in, in Canada. So this is uh, what the raw images sort of look like coming off the trap. 
You can see here the localization. We also do tracking, so we can tra track individuals uh, through the image. Uh, that's useful for doing the classification because you can provide multiple cutouts of the same individual to aid classification. And this is the classification step where we have uh, some, some non-moths, uh, some things that are just classified as moth. There's one which had like a green box around it where the species level is not confident, so it's just returned as a moth. And these others where in blue, where it's, it's been given a species identity and a probability. So next steps for this project is to think about how we, how we open up all these tools for, for anyone to use. So um, currently that bit of hardware that I talked about, um, we're, we're going to be publishing that in an open, open journal. Uh, the design is open. Um, CH is currently kind of manufacturing them in small numbers for research researchers who want to use them. We're also trying to develop this online platform where anyone can upload their images uh, from their moth traps um, and have them classified and you know, choose the model they want to use uh, to classify them. Uh, so kind of meaning that you no longer need to have that large GPU compute locally um, and that sort of thing. One thing we're very conscious of is that a lot of these developments are happening in, in, in Europe and North America. But a lot of biodiversity monitoring that we need to do is in the tropics uh, where people may not have access to that sort of compute. So we're trying to build a, a platform which would allow you know, anyone around the world to, to use this sort of technology and, and, and to get insight. This would also allow experts to come in and, and validate and verify data that's being collected and, and contribute to the, to the kind of openly available data set of, of labeled moth images. So, um, why are we doing all this? I mean, when I presented it to start with, I was talking about uh, the interest in, in putting things out where people couldn't go in the network rail context because of safety. It could also be because it's just impractical. So putting things out in, you know, in, in very remote locations where it's difficult to get surveyors uh, to go in and out. Uh, but even beyond that, it has benefits, even if it's in, in places which are relatively accessible, because of the frequency at which you're sampling, you can gain uh, new insights. So uh, we have species phenology. So phenology is uh, some change in some something biological uh, over time uh, and we typically look at things like the abundance of of moths through a year so he'd have like two peaks as two generations of this moth for example through the year but this could also now be through a single night because all of our records are, are time stamped uh, so that would you know, open up new avenues of research um, we could also look at the species frequency so typically you know when you go out and do a, a moth trap you, you'll get a measure of, of abundance with this trap, you're really in more of a measure of activity than abundance. Um, but you can look at this, this, this relative frequency, relative activity, um, and that will be quite robust because you're sampling over a, a, long, a longer period of time more frequently. Uh, and the species abundances or, or activity can be quite impacted by weather and things like that. So getting that greater coverage is going to give great, greater robustness to these kind of species, species checklists and relative frequencies, relative abundances. Also, because it's um, you know, a standardized approach, uh, you know, the same system, uh, you can use the same AI model uh, for um, the classification, you can be quite um, sure that the data is robust to analysis across time. Uh, whereas it wouldn't be uncommon uh, for moth surveys, for different people to conduct the moth survey in different years, and you'll have variation introduced by the individual expert who's doing, doing that, that study. So this should be able to give us um, robust data for uh, interannual uh, changes also within year because you can sample you know up to every night if you want to and so you could look at variation quite fine uh, temporal uh, variation uh, and that might be in relation to some sort of management that's taking place whether that's spraying in an agricultural setting or logging or um, or more seasonal patterns there's also other things such as uh, biomass estimation so from these images we can measure the length of a, of the body of a moth and from from you known experimentation of you know, weighing uh, these insects um, and measuring the lengths, we can we can use formulae to work out the biomass of each of those individuals. And the biomass of insects is kind of the underpinning of the food chain in many systems. So that's something that you know, ecologists are very interested in biomass. So we can get to biomass estimation. And we have also seen some species interaction. So in Panama, we had some praying mantis uh, on the board, so eating things that were coming in. So there's some species interaction information in there as well. And undoubtedly, there's there's other things that we haven't we haven't thought about. So the next case study I want to talk about is about using uh, improving AI by reflecting on how humans uh, observe and identify species. So, so in this case, I'm going to I'm going to focus on ladybirds. 
Now, uh, if you show this to uh, an image classifier, AI, it's essentially using the values in all these pixels and how they're arranged to find patterns, uh, which then correlate to species. Uh, and in a sense, that's how the human brain works as well when we're trying to identify something from an image. But a, a human naturalist would also ask the question of, you know, what, what's the leaf that this insect is sitting on? Where has that observation come in from? What time of year? And in fact, in our volunteer-led recording schemes, uh, when data comes in, we have automatic flags for these sorts of things. You know, is, has it come in from out, outside of its known range? Has it come in from a time of year where we wouldn't expect the adult form of the ladybird to be flying? And these sorts of things. So these are important attributes for understanding whether this is correct or not. So when observation, when an image comes in, we can actually get a lot of this data because images will come in with a, with a date stamp. And when they come into our uh, recording platforms, they come in with a location as well. And from there, we can reach out to other open data sets and we can get these other data, uh, such as you know, the, the date in relation to the known flight period of the species, uh, what's the weather like in the previous week, what's the, the weather like in the previous few months, um, what's the habitat in that location, et cetera, et cetera. So we can, we can get all the secondary metadata, which a human naturalist would use as a part of their process of reaching the identification. So the question then is, if we uh, build this into an AI um, classifier, does it perform better than, uh, than just the standard approach? So this is the standard approach. We have an image, it goes into a deep learning algorithm and the predictions come out at the end. We can then also uh, use a similar um, machine learning approach where we combine all these secondary metadata together. Um, we put them through a few layers uh, and we'll get um, uh, probabilities or scores for each of the species. And then we can multiply that probability with the probability that came out from the image classifier. So in this way, this, um, this kind of metadata is acting as a prior uh, on, on, on the, the image classifier. So the image classifier might think it's species A, but if it really is the wrong time of year, um, then this probability on the left-hand side would be low, and that's going to downweight the probability for the image classifier. So by multiplying those together, we get these predictions. Uh, and the final approach is to combine the layers um, partway through uh, the network. So uh, these two start off independently, then they get combined, and then we have some more layers. So it's kind of learning. It, it's more all embedded in one deep learning model, uh, and the model is able to, to learn uh, across these factors, it might be that certain characteristics are only uh, visually uh, represented in the image at certain times a year. So it can, it can do these sorts of things, and that produces predictions as well. So when we look at these side by side, you see that the image only has the lowest score. When we combine them together by uh, multiplying in that kind of prior format, it's somewhat intermediate. And when we combine them together in one model, that's the most performant. So this is really good. Uh, it kind of um, agrees with kind of our expectations. And that's why we do it as humans. We would expect with this additional information, which we know is relevant and assists in classification that we'd expect to improve performance. And that's, that's indeed what we see. I think my, since we published it back in uh, 2019, my view on this has, has changed a little bit. I think that whilst it's the most performant, what's also important when we think about uh, the uses of AI is their interpretability and their trust. And so, when we present the result to the user, I'm of the growing opinion that actually we want to be able to disentangle this. We want to be able to show them that the image looks right, but that it's probably the wrong time of year, or it seems like it's in the wrong habitat. I think actually when we present to the user, we want to have that kind of granularity. Um, so the user can then use that information to update their, their classification or, or to assess where the AI is, is misunderstanding. Um, species. So I think this is uh, clever and performs well, but um, I now wonder whether it's always uh, the right approach for when we think about deploying things for, for users. And that kind of brings me on to my final case study, which is around how do we make these tools useful to people? How do we get these kind of AI tools in people's hands so they can use them to help, help in their monitoring? I know there are others who are careful and diligent and watchful and kind too. But they do not bring in the data. 
How do I move towards their absence? So in, in this little passage from the poem, I think the, the data set is sharing uh, probably a lot of our anxieties, which is that there's lots of people out all around the countryside every day observing wildlife. Um, but they're not all natural historians. They're not all recording that data and sharing it. Many of them may well be recording it and tweeting about it, but it's not making its way through into our data sets. And so here the data sets kind of acknowledging that and asking how do we how do we move towards their absence, the absence of data? How do we begin to collect that data that people are observing? And that's uh, that's sort of what we're trying to do in eSurveyor. So eSurveyor is a mobile app. It's free to use. It's available in the app stores. And it incorporates AI to help people to monitor uh, the environment. And it's particularly targeted at farmers. Okay. <coughs> So the motivation behind the app is kind of threefold. So we want to help to educate farmers. So farmers in the UK are increasingly becoming custodians of uh, the countryside. Okay, we're increasingly receiving payment for things that are not just growing food, that are also you know planting wildflower strips or establishing woodland with carbon credits, etc. Um, so one of the one of the things we want to do in the app is to help to raise awareness of um, the flora and fauna that's being supported by these interventions. We want to provide information that's actionable. So uh, the kind of so what question, you know, the farmers should be able to use information in there to do something to help to help what their, their kind of land management. And we wanted to provide evidence. So uh, you know, farmers are increasingly being asked to, to do these sort of interventions and increasingly asked to evidence what they've done. And so it's a tool for doing that. And I've, I've kind of put an emphasis on farmers, but it's worth saying actually, and hopefully as we go through, you'll see this, it's actually what much more widely applicable to any kind of land manager and, and monitoring all sorts of different um, environments. So the mobile app you can see on the right-hand side, one of its core components is that you can take photographs of flowers and it will give, using an AI an image classifier developed by the guys at Plantnet in, in Montpellier in France, um, it will give uh, some some suggestions. And just to flag here, two things that I think are really important for image classifiers um, when you're when you're creating a user interface with users. I think number one, you should always represent the uncertainty of the model. Uh, you should never just, in this case, for example, you should never just say it's it's common birds for trefoil without any statistic. It's really important, I think, to cascade that uncertainty, to be honest and transparent about that. And the second thing is you want to make it um, easily falsifiable. Okay, so you want to provide in other alternative suggestions and you want to provide the data that the user could use to prove or disprove that classification. So in this case, that's images of uh, the plant that's been observed. Uh, actually, in this case, what it does is it finds images of that species that look most like the image the user has taken. So if this was an image of a leaf rather than the flower, you'd see images of leaves rather than flowers down here. And I think that's really crucial. And you can imagine how this could work with acoustics and with other things too. But I think that's that's really important when we think about the user interface. Uh, we need to think about how we kind of are really transparent. And, and I think this all you know, builds into that you know, trustworthy AI, all that, those sorts of discussions as well. Um, <clears throat> we also show, uh, so once you've, um, taking a picture of a, a single flower or, or a whole suite of flowers, you'll get information on the insects that that flower is supporting. So we have data from, from uh, past projects that we've done and from published literature on which species associate with which flowers. And so we can present this to the farmer. So it's kind of showing the, the benefit that these, these flowers are, are providing. Um, so as I said, you can, you can take a picture of a single flower. You can also take a picture of all the flowers that you see in your wildflower margin, for example. So here's a, a bunch of flowers observed in the wildflower margin. Um, again, the AI has been used to help research classifications. And we get this report um, about all the different flowers, the number of insect, insects they support, the total number of insects being supported, insect species being supported by that habitat. Uh, and here, the number of um, plants that have grown, that have been observed from the seed mix that was put in. So we have a database of the seed mixes that farmers use, the farmer can select which one they've used. And so this is this is then actual information. So they can look at this and see which of their plants grew, which didn't, uh, and, uh, and act upon that in the future. Uh, 
just one point on this, this species number here. Obviously, we're not observing the insects directly. So we're inferring the presence of species from the plant communities that are there and the known uh, interactions of insects in those plants. Um, obviously, the true number of insects present will be lower than this. And we're also looking to, uh, in the future, add in uh, geographic information. So we know the ranges of is each of these 268 species. So we could subset this to just a location where that observation was made. Uh, so that's a, a change to come in the future. Another thing farmers are particularly interested in is in the um, beneficial insects. So um, there will be insects that are supported by those plants they've, they've sown in their wildflower margin, for example. There'll be insects that are, that, that, that are living there that eat the pests of their crops. So whilst as an ecologist, I guess I'm principally interested in the wider biodiversity that's been supported by this, these interventions, the farmers are particularly interested in these beneficial insects that are going to help their crops. Uh, and so this screen on the right hand side is basically showing you the number of beneficial insects we've got in that in that habitat and uh, and which and which crops they're they're benefiting. And CH done quite a lot of work in the past looking at uh, how these beneficials support crop yields, and we found that if you take out the least productive parts of of fields and you put in uh, these kind of seed mixes, you actually don't decrease the yield of that field. Um, because first of all, the bit you take took out of production wasn't particularly productive in the first place, but also because these insects that have been introduced are benefiting, increasing the yield in your field, either through pollination um, or through a predation of pests. Um, so we also have the kind of third um, mode currently in the app is it allows you to do a transect. So you put down a, a, a square on the ground and you identify all the, the plants in it. Then you move on a few meters, put it down again, identify all the plants in it and do this a number of times. And this is a kind of established protocol for monitoring um, habitat quality. Uh, it also takes a lot longer. Uh, so uh, currently a lot, uh, you know, the farmers who are using the app, not many of them are using this approach. They're, they're mainly using that, uh, the approach I showed before where you can just take a bunch of pictures of the flowers in the habitat. Um, but if you do do this, then you can then compare um, across time, you can compare across fields, you can compare within farming clusters, and you can compare to benchmarks as well. So it kind of gives that more robust uh, data to be able to do those kind of rigorous comparisons. Um, it also allows us to, uh, well, one, of the, one of the reasons we developed this is to kind of provide that evidence. So all the images collected are, are geo-referenced, we get, we get the GPS. Um, so you'd expect the data to look like like these um, uh, four sets, clusters of points going up the side of the field here, collecting images around each quadrat. Uh, we could also identify pictures which weren't taken in that location. So if we're worried about people cheating or gaming the system, uh, particularly if there's like financial payments um, involved here, that's going to be obviously quite critical, as is the ability to go and review these images. So all the images, all the data is collected through the app is put on a, on a server. Um, and if the farmer chooses, that can be shared with others who can then come in and, and kind of, you know, uh, double check their, their, their images, etc. So that was my uh, final example. I just want to have some, some sort of closing thoughts. Um, the first is thinking about, this is another mid-journey uh, image here. Uh, I asked it to produce <laughs> an image of Charles Darwin lecturing to some androids. So thinking about now, what is the role of the human as we move to this more AI-centered uh, way of monitoring biodiversity. Clearly, we have initially this big role in generating data, the data required and doing that, that validation. But also, we have a role in, in, in using that AI. And I think it's worth thinking about uh, how, and how, how that transition is made as well. Often, when I give these presentations to the biological recording community, there's a lot of fear about how this might come in and, and upset the, the current balance, the current way of, of recording. And people get a lot of joy out of going that and monitoring biodiversity. We don't want to, we don't want to uh, stop that. So I think we need to think quite a bit about how this is going to change uh, biodiversity monitoring. And kind of in partnership with that, we think about what, what is our responsibility as the developers of these tools and technologies? How will they impact the planet? Obviously, you know, we're talking about biodiversity monitoring and environmental monitoring. So it should be all to save the planet. But you know, running these models and training these models uses a lot of energy. 
And if we're, if we're updating our model every month, that's generating a significant amount of CO2 from the data centers that run these things. So we need, we need to keep that in mind. And we also need to think about negative, potential negative impacts that some of these technologies might have on, on users. You might, might, for example, volunteers feel, feel marginalized as, as, as AI increasingly comes in and, and is used, um, or taxonomists feel like they're being uh, used simply to train their replacement in the AI. So we need to think carefully about that as people who are impacted by this technology. And then finally, um, a kind of emerging pattern is this, uh, this transition from model-centric design. So when we first, um, you know, with AI was first being developed for uh, computer vision, things like this, we, uh, not we, I wasn't involved. <laughs> people thought a lot about the model, the design of the model. Okay, and that was really important. And we got to kind of uh, uh, convolutional neural nets and they performed really well. And we saw big improvements in accuracy. Um, I think now, we're kind of in this kind of data centric uh, phase where actually changes to the model don't alter things, the results too much. Um, what really makes a difference is their training data. So if you look at like chat GPT and its various iterations, it's that big increase in the amount of data and the quality of that data uh, that's led to its kind of improvements, not necessarily so much the change in the model design. And I think we're gonna move now or, or in the future, we'll move to uh, this kind of interface centric design where the, the models are good, the data is good, and now we need to think about how do we how do people interface with these models? Uh, how are they used on mobile apps? How are they deployed uh, autonomously on servers, you know, scraping data off social media or, or whatever? Um, and that's really interesting. I think it starts bringing us into this kind of you know, societal space where it's you know, the interface of AI and society, and probably we need to be working more with sort of social scientists and people like that, thinking about how how this all all plays out, but I think for most applications, we're not we're not quite there yet. So just finally to, to thank everyone who's involved. There's a, a really big team of people uh, involved with Amy. That's the automated uh, moth trap. So thanks to all of them. The data sets dream. Um, that was the, the poem. There's also some visual art that goes along with that. You can check it out that link. And again, uh, we'll be talking more about that at the digital gathering. Uh, East Vea, um, thanks to them. And the, uh, the Thinking Like a Naturalist paper led by uh, Chris Terry. And I'll uh, finish there. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Tom. That's excellent. Very exciting stuff. Um, so we've got, to, yeah, just to remind people to post uh, questions in the chat. We've got a couple there ready, but please do. I'm sure lots of people have got lots of questions there. Uh, um, first one from Laura saying, really interesting talk. Thank you. I'll read through it if that's okay, but you could probably see it yourself just to check I get the facts right. Um, for your case study of using AI to validate the classification of moth photos, you said a probability of it being a species, a specific species is calculated using known ranges and times of species occurrence. I was wondering whether this approach um, would risk dismissing correctly identified species that are invasive or are present due to shifting ranges due to climate change. Uh, do you risk suppressing picking up trends such as shifting species ranges by taking this approach? Yeah, that's a really valid point. So I think um, it's obviously in that case, it's kind of it's probabilistic. So I guess the closer you get towards the edge of uh, the range and maybe beyond the established range, the probability kind of comes down. So you're right that if a new species is observed, say, think about that climate change example, uh, you know, northward range shift, if it's just beyond that northern range, you're right, it will, it will be downgraded. So that is something that we need to, we need to think about. Um, it obviously impacts as well how often you need to retrain that model. So you probably want, you'd want to retrain that, or maybe that half of the model on the, um, on the, on the metadata side, relatively frequently to keep up with that. When we think about an invasive species, you know, something that comes from America, uh, for example, in, into the UK, then you know, it, it would be, uh, could be unknown or, or, its, or its range could be completely independent that it would you know, have a kind of zero probability that would then you know, come out. So yeah, that's, that's really interesting to think about. I mean, it's a wider problem as well of kind of out of sample observations. So the same with the images. Um, so in Panama, you know, approximately a fifth of the species that we were observing were not known to science, let alone do they have any images of them. And so we need to have classifiers that are capable of classifying things that they know uh, and um, perhaps through some sort of unsupervised methods, uh, establishing the presence of things that they don't know and clustering them into, into kind of morphotypes. So yeah, it, it is a problem uh, and we need to think about uh, that. I think especially around invasive alien species, which is also a really big, really hot topic. 
Thanks, Tom. So this question from another Tom, can you comment further about quantifying uncertainty from CNN, so image analysis outputs? What does the percentage mean, like from a SoftMax uh, function? Yeah, so hands up, I'm, you know, I'm not a, a deep learning expert. Um, the, the, the values sum to one. So every class that the CNN is classifying, uh, so in, in, in our case, there's something, you know, tens of ladybird species, each class is given a score and those scores sum to one. So you could view that as a probability, but it's not, it's not really a probability. So uh, there might be two species which look really similar. For example, they would be given and, and the original image looked like those and they'd be given kind of roughly equal weighting. Um, so um, I think a lot of people do interpret it as a probability. You're probably not going to get too far wrong if you do, but I, but I know that the, um, the computer science experts have told me it's not a probability. Uh, so there's a related one then from John uh, Cooper. So in deep learning, when, when the classification of an image is combined with species specific attributes, can you easily identify which attributes might have shown the classification is not to be trusted? Yeah, this, this comes back to my conversation about how wrapping it all in one model kind of makes it harder to, to disentangle and actually I think it's I actually think it's better just to to show things in that disentangled form independently and what we did do was um, we uh, randomized uh, the inputs um, of each of those uh, environmental variables uh, independently of one another so basically that was a way of um, uh, assessing the sensitivity of the predictions to each of those input variables. Um, so we could then, uh, through that, we could show that the habitat specialists, right, that the ladybirds only occur in one type of habitat, were particularly sensitive to changes in that habitat measure. And species which only came out late in the year were particularly sensitive to changes in that uh, date of the year um, parameter. So we were able to kind of validate that approach um, through the fact that the model was learning known characteristics, um, known environmental characteristics and, and time of year characteristics of those species. Do, do you know of any um, the image methods that could help even identify which part of the image is giving the information? You know, you could say whether it's the leaves or the flower or something else. Yeah, so you can, yeah, you can do that. So you can create these kind of like heat maps as well. So I guess my explanation there was talking about that um, yeah, yeah. metadata side. If you're interested in the image side, then you can create heat maps, which kind of show you the areas of activation. So which part of the images were key to reaching the determination. And that's actually quite an important sense check to do in the process. You know, if you've got pictures of ladybirds and the activation hotspots on the leaf, you know, that it's on, then that means actually it's predicting based on the host plant rather than, than species, uh, which might, well, I mean, it probably would be useful information for predicting a ladybird, but uh, probably not what you're looking for. So yeah, that's important. And can it could it do that on the on the fly from the app, so you could feed that back to the users to get them to take a better photo? That's a good question. Video. That's a good question. I'm not sure how resource intensive it is intensive it is to produce those. Okay, thanks. So um, here's a question from Nicola. Um, do you see a way forward for using technology like this in hyper diverse regions like the tropics, where many species might not be classified, or only a few experts can classify them? Could it be combined with, for example, DNA barcoding? Yeah, great. We actually have a two-year project just starting up on exactly this. So we're going to be putting out systems in uh, various regions of the tropics. Um, I think we we acknowledge that this works great in the UK because we have loads of training data. But out in the tropics, as I said, we took one out in Panama, and you know, most uh, a, a significant proportion of the species are not known, and of those that are known, very few have uh, image libraries. So uh, we need to look at unsupervised methods. I think. We also need to, you know, appreciate that this just can't solve by AI on its own. Right? We need to fund local in-country partners who have a lot of local knowledge already and expertise to kind of go out and, and, and collect specimens and take photographs and build up those training data sets. And also to you know, inform the modelers, you know, what species can't be told apart visually. You know, we often just bung in species species names. That's we're going to classify everything to species names. That's how we as ecologists think everything has to be, you know, to a species name. Um, but when an AI is looking at stuff, if it can't be identified except by dissecting its genitalia, which is the case with some of these moss species, there's just no point in having them in separate classes. So using that local knowledge to understand, you know, what classes need to be aggregated. Um, eDNA could could form a part of that. So when people are going out and, and building these, these, 
these collections to start to build these AI models, then it would be sensible to use eDNA, eDNA as part of that process to you know, assure, quality assure the identification, but also because some of these things probably won't have been described before. Thank you. So this um, sort of slightly related question. Um, how much of a problem is it when you train the model on pictures that aren't taken in the exact same context as that you want to use the model in? Um, so, yeah, pictures from different backgrounds or different quality or, I guess, different uh, temperature areas or those sorts of things. Does it or does it not make much difference? Yeah, so it is a problem. It's actually more of a problem than I kind of intuitively thought it would be. Um, that translation, yeah. So. Obviously, we're training on, or the, the, our partners in Canada are training on these GBIF images, which are taken kind of from smartphones or digital SLRs. And then we're translating that to be used on the trap, and we do see a drop off in performance. Um, so it is important to, to, as soon as you can, start adding in data from, from your data set to, to support the, the training of that. Um, yeah, I think there was a second part of that question, which I've forgotten. Thanks. Okay. Um, yeah. It's sort of related to that then. Do you, do you think you could get to the point where they're quite, um, yeah, kind of uh, sensor agnostic models? You know, because often I can see the situation where you've got, you know, a different, a different type of camera, different sort of thing, and it, and you have to build another data set and label it and everything. Yeah, so we're we're trying to build these this as agnostic. So you know, if someone else builds a great camera system, that's fantastic. Let's use that and and. Uh, uh, I think the thing, things like you know, white balance, uh, focus, sharpness, these sorts of things will have an impact. That's why uh, we're increasingly thinking it's important to you know, have a metadata standard so that anyone who is collecting these images can have this metadata, which we can use to perhaps select the right kind of model. I imagine in, you know, in a decade's time, we'll probably have hierarchical models um, that are, you know, that, uh, you know, it can identify it's a moth or not a moth and things in the moths go to this thing and it can identify the family and then it goes to some models. I think these kind of hierarchy of models we're going to see more often, maybe even like models to detect the, the white balance and correct that and, and that sort of thing. So, yeah. And then I just remembered the, the thing I want to say from the other was about um, if we train from images out of range and then we're predicting, so not, not just from different data sources, but from different ranges, that can also be a problem because things like moths can have slightly different uh, visual appearance depending on on their range, so that does introduce um, an additional challenge when trying to translate across space. Okay, um, so for the Oliver says thanks for an interesting talk. Um, do you ever see a point where the AI classifier has been trained so well that it no longer is validated by classifications determined by humans, but instead switches to validate human-made classifications? Yeah, I think for so for things like um, like uh, a Coke can. Uh, you can develop a classifier that is you know, almost perfect because the Coke can always looks the same, assuming, assuming intact Coke cans. Um, you know, the design is specified. To, so, and there are, you know, some moths and butterflies and other insects that are really visually distinctive. Like the peacock butterfly, for example, in the UK is really visually distinctive. And I can imagine it's getting to a point where we think it's probably no longer worthwhile of trying to validate that. And it's also a very common species. Um, that we might want to push those things through. The, the benefit I see there is it allows us to move expert uh, effort away from the common and easy and straightforward to the species that are kind of more difficult. So it, it's kind of allowing us to get those expertise to, to where it's really needed. Um, so yeah, I think that, that could happen. Um, probably, it will probably always be limited to a subset of species that are easy to classify. Thanks. Um, Tom says, did you, use, did you use an image augmentation to generate your training data, so much, which might help with white balance focus? Yeah, we did, we did all the kind of regular uh, standard protocols for augmentation. I'm also interested in, in things like um, generation as well. So um, uh, we've got colleagues in the, the same partners over in Denmark, and they, they're interested in taking images on complex backgrounds. So a camera looking at some flowers, for example, and then trying to monitor the bees on it. That's that's much harder because you've not got a white background like we do. And they've looked at generating training data by you know uh, uh, masking out bees from one image and then putting them all over other images, other backgrounds, right, which have no bees on. I think that's kind of interesting, thinking about how you can like simulate training data. Um, obviously, yeah, there's also some biases that could be introduced, et cetera. But it's quite an interesting, I think, avenue for, for exploring. Um, I had one about the, the, 
the the farmer tool that e surveyor is that right mm -hmm. um, yeah does that does that also take into account contextual information as well as the, the flower photos for example of the weather location etc yeah so at the moment it's just it's just using the image it's not doing anything fancy but we're gonna hopefully build that in in time so these we have these kind of species distribution models um it uh, i mean it does it does so the the model it's using actually is global um and it does subset to the uk flora um but interesting point here is that when someone the thing about that like user-centric design when someone downloads the surveyor app what's the first plant they're going to take a picture of it's probably going to be something in their garden or in the office which is not a uk species so if we have if we subset to the uk list then the first image they're going to take is going to get it wrong and then they're not going to use the app anymore because i think it's no good so that, there's kind of an interesting conundrum there so we now have a, we now basically if it's if it's very confident as a species it's not in the uk it does pass that through to the user but kind of flags it as not being a uk species um so these are kind of yeah the interesting things you have to think about that's interesting thanks um on the uh the the moth traps do you just the kind of just the does the use of the light affect the you know if you use that every night in the same location? Do you think that would actually affect the moths themselves? And what what how do you do about that? Yeah, so one of the one of the kind of key things about a moth trap is it's non-lethal. Uh, one of the problems is if you run the moth trap every night, the moths are kind of attracted into that light. Daytime comes, they don't fly. Night comes, the lights on again, and they stay there. So you act as kind of like sink. Um, it also is going to affect your results because you're you're actually recording moths that were there from the previous night. You would expect to aggregate species over time, which isn't what you want if you're looking at temporal changes. So uh, we now go for a kind of one night on, one night off, or as a minimum, or, or more nights off in between. Another thing we do is we turn off the light a couple of hours before sunrise, because we actually found if you run it all the way up to sunrise, the moths stay there, the sun comes up, then the moths don't move, and then birds learn that there's this buffet and we've got sort of trail camera footage of these birds just repeatedly visiting in, in the morning and clearing up what's on the board again that's not really living up to its kind of non-lethal ambitions so um yeah we're learning as we go but there are ways that we can counteract those kind of negative effects great um how do you get farmers to know about use of air and be remember to use it yeah i'm really glad someone brought this up so I think one thing I've come to appreciate is that when you're budgeting for an app like this, probably half of your budget should be going to engagement and outreach and that sort of stuff, because the kind of um, you know build it and they will come it is not a thing uh, for technology. So at the moment, um, we didn't have that budget. So we kind of have um, uh, farmer kind of collaborators and clusters and there's some commercial people who are kind of using it. Um, and we're kind of slowly building that community. Um, because we're kind of constantly trying to improve it and update it, we don't want it to be like too flooded with people at the moment because you know we it's not perfect and we want to be able to make improvements as we go. But we're kind of slowly, kind of organically um, building that building that audience. Um, but we have had we have had we get, we go to farming events and we've done you know, press releases and things like that to try and get farmers on board. Thanks. I've got last one. So the, and the poem, which was great, um, was that AI generated? No, no, no. So it's written by a poet called Thomas Sharp, who's uh, up in York. And there was a link on my final slide there. Um, so people can go back and, and pick it up. Or if you just Google a dataset stream, uh, you'll find it. You can read the full poem. That that the uh the audio is actually 18 minutes long. So it's quite it's quite a long poem, but there's some real gems in there. And, and just on that is it, working with artists definitely took me out of my com comfort zone and some and some of it's like pretty wacky um but it does give that completely new view on your science from a completely outside its perspective which is quite refreshing and there's there's always there was i've always found that there was something to learn every time i chat to them do you just um do you think that's actually me like making people really think about the data and going to look about it more look at it more or are they just kind of enjoying it for what it is I think I think predominantly the latter. I think probably predominantly people are enjoying it for what it is. Um, but we did do kind of interviews with people once they'd because it was a it was an installation, so some visual art, and people were walking around these sculptures whilst listening to the to the poem. We did interview people once they'd done that, and people people did say it kind of gave them a kind of newfound understanding of of kind of biological recording and the importance of it, and got them really just got them thinking about this data that's collected and how is it used and who should be collecting it and who should be using it and what does it all mean but put i want this was predominantly art okay it wasn't like um public communication which i've done a fair amount of before you know it was like handing over our story to artists and then generating 
art. So, so the principal you know, impact was that kind of engagement and enjoyment aspect. Great, thanks very much. I think that's probably all we've got time for. Um, thanks very much, Tom, it's a fantastic talk.